Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final breakout session of the day. This is session 1D in our Facilitating Access Track, Improving Effectiveness of Reentry and Supported Housing Models. This is not the final session of the summit, however. We do invite you to stick around after this session closes to join us for our closing plenary roundtable discussion. As you know, my name is Kristen King. I'll be your producer for this session. I want to let you know this session, as well as all others in the summit, is being recorded. The views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation and discussion do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services or the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. That, I'm going to open up the line for our moderator, Sherry Downing, and Sherry is going to kick us off. Sherry? Thanks, Kristen. Welcome, everyone. I am so excited to be here. Um, as you've heard me say, this will be the fourth time. So excited to be here. If you'd take a second and type into the public chat, where are you coming in from? I'd love to hear. Um, we've had great participation, and the chat box has been a wonderful resource for all of you, we've had lots of good connections made. So you are at track one, facilitating access, and this is webinar D, improving effectiveness of reentry and supported housing models. We have brought three speakers to this session who have spectacularly interesting and um, important information to share with you. So I'm excited about that. Please take a moment and um, ask your questions in the box as we go along. Um, I'm going to introduce all of our speakers to begin with, and then I'll have a couple more slides, and then I'll hand it off to Dr. Steven Strzelecki, who is the lead clinical psychologist and at the Forensic Evaluations Unit in Mecklenburg County Criminal Justice Services, Charlotte, North Carolina. Dr. Strzelecki and his staff at Mecklenburg County Criminal Justice Services conduct court-ordered psychological evaluations and cultivate partnerships with other criminal justice programs, Mecklenburg County departments, and community agencies, all in an effort to meet the needs of individuals who've become involved in the criminal justice system and who are also affected by mental health issues, substance use disorders, or intellectual and developmental disabilities. In this capacity, Dr. Strzelecki serves as the co-chair for Mecklenburg County Stepping Up Committee, which is part of the national Stepping Up initiative designed to reduce the number of people in jail with mental illness and increase access to behavioral health services. He also serves as a local lead for the SOAR Criminal Justice Program and the project director for a comprehensive opioid abuse program grant from the U.S. Department of Justice that focuses on addressing issues related to opioid misuse among individuals involved in the criminal justice system. So I'm excited about your, your presentation, Dr. Strzelecki. I'm excited to hear the information you'll share. We also have with us Justin Volpe, who is a jail diversion peer liaison in the Miami-Dade County Jail Diversion Program of Community Health of South Florida. Mr. Volpe is a certified recovery support specialist working with the 11th Judicial Circuit Criminal Mental Health Project Jail Diversion Program since 2008. As a successful graduate of the program, Mr. Volpe has firsthand knowledge of the importance of ensuring the availability of timely, high-quality, behavioral health treatment services in the community. After experiencing a series of psychiatric health crises, which led to a period of unstable living conditions, disruption of family and social support, and brief involvement in the justice system, he became engaged in treatment and support services in the community. And today, Mr. Volpe enjoys a full and productive life in recovery serving as an inspiration and a role model for many, many others. He's been a national consultant since 2011 and has helped train more than 2,500 crisis intervention team officers in Miami-Dade County, Florida since 2008. And he has supported more than 1,000 people in getting out of jail and back into the community. He now owns his own home, is married, 
and has a son. And I will assure you that you are in for a treat to hear from Mr. Volpe. I have thoroughly enjoyed our conversation leading into this event. Finally, we welcome Regina, or Reggie Huter, um, MA. She is a subject matter expert with one of our HHRN partners, Policy Research Associates. Ms. Huter is known nationally for her expertise in creating justice system change, behavioral health and trauma-informed practices, gangs, and youth subcultures. She joined PRA in 2017 to provide training and technical assistance to counties engaged in the MacArthur Safety and Justice Challenge and those addressing the intersection of behavioral health and justice. She has served as the Executive Director of the Denver Office of Behavioral Health Strategies and Crime Prevention and Control Commission and Metro Denver Partners, where she developed adult mentor screening tools created special programs for young women, and helped create the Gang Rescue and Support Program. She ran the Juvenile Diversion Program at the Denver District Attorney's Office and served on Colorado's Criminal and Juvenile Justice Commission. She currently sits on the Governor's Behavioral Health Transformation Council. She um, was also the Chief Executive Officer for Urban Peak, a youth-focused homeless housing and intervention program. Um, and I'll just tell you that she began her work with youth as a counselor in residential facilities and volunteer for Partners, a youth mentoring organization. She has a master's degree in counseling from the University of Colorado and works as adjunct faculty for Metropolitan State University of Denver. She is the recipient of Nine News, Nine Who Care, and 2008 National Alliance on Mental Illness Colorado heroes in the fight for her advocacy. So, Reggie, we are so delighted to have you here. I know that everyone is going to be very excited to hear what you have to share. So, with that, um, I will tell you that our agenda will start with Dr. Strzecki, move to Justin Volpe, and be closed out by Roger Huerter. Then we'll have time for some questions and answers, so please do keep those coming and then we'll move into closing. After closing, I really hope that you will join us for the round table. The one yesterday was spectacular, and I know that this one will be as well. After today, we are hoping that you'll be able to understand the benefits of using the SSI, SSDI, Outreach and Ac Access and Recovery, or SOAR, um, tools before people are released from jail be able to list some of the housing available to reentry populations. This is something we hear from all over the country, that this is really hard to get housing for people coming back to the community after serving time in uh, the correction system. Understand the sequential intercept model and be able to describe the housing resource framework. So with that, if you would just take a second and type into the chat box, what do you hope to get out of today's session? What would, what would it mean for this to be time well spent for you? So if you would take a moment to do that, that would be fabulous and much appreciated. I will tell you that we use this information and will use it uh, to inform our TA for the next year. So it's important to hear from you. And with that, Dr. Strzaki, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Sherry, and thank you for that introduction. And uh, Kristen, thank you for your technical support. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, we are certainly excited that you are here to join us today as part of this virtual summit. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, talk with you today about some of the issues related to the interaction of housing, behavioral health, and criminal justice. I am um, Excited to share some of the uh, programs that we have going on in our area in North Carolina to uh, address housing, but even more so to be part of this panel. And um, after I get hand the microphone off to Justin and Reggie and be able to listen to them talk on their subject areas, you know, Justin brings his unique perspective to the table in discussing uh, innovative and successful approaches to creating and sustaining housing programs. Uh, Reggie is a uh, multi-subject expert. Um, she has a wealth of knowledge and, and experience in almost every area that you could imagine, mental health, criminal justice, and housing. 
and we'll be using uh, that background to talk about maximizing and leveraging resources in your community to address some of the housing needs that you would see with your clients. Um, and to get things started, I, I wanted to just uh, cover a couple of general concepts that uh, I want to make sure we're all on the same page as in some of the parameters of our presentation, because there's certainly a lot of things that we can cover, and we're going to try and address those um, that we, we are most uh, important to the audience. Um, one is just to acknowledge that uh, affordable housing is a, is a nationwide issue. I don't think it matters whether you're in the city or suburbs, east coast, west coast, or in the heartland. Um, I think all communities are facing issues with regards to uh, affordable housing for uh, individuals and families. Um, and the fact that we as presenters come from different geographical areas um, are all, and our communities are all facing the same issues, I think is an a testament to that. Um, I also want to acknowledge that individuals that are involved with the criminal justice system also face additional challenges that are somewhat unique. Um, I, I think we, as part of the summit, are certainly talking about mental health and substance use issues and, and within the criminal justice population, that certainly is a significant issue and challenge. Um, in addition to mental health, there's also uh, trauma-related information and experiences that um, our population uh, experience. And that's a completely different topic, but SAMHSA has some fantastic information on websites about trauma-informed criminal justice system. Uh, but it's just certainly something to be aware of when you're working with individuals who are just as involved. A couple other things, just you know, roadblocks to um, vocation, oppor vocation opportunities. Uh, our individuals who have criminal records oftentimes can't pass a background check or uh, because they're a convicted felon or aren't hired for jobs. And so meaningful employment is, is a challenge, uh, as is you know, restrictions to housing. And oftentimes if an individual wants to live with a family member, you may have a lease that uh, prohibits someone with a criminal background to live there, and so they are prevented from going back home or living with a family member. And so, again, housing is, is a significant challenge uh, for our population. And as a general rule, we're talking about reentry. Uh, traditionally, I think people think about um, return to a community from a prison sentence, whether state or federal. But I also want to make sure we include um, return from local jails. Um, Certainly some individuals serve their sentences in community jails, um, as well as uh, individuals can be held in jail for a, a, on pre-trial status uh, and released based on time served or have their charges dismissed and might end up being in jail for days, weeks, and sometimes months. So their needs in terms of housing and returning to the community are just as significant as uh, the other individuals. And, and, and finally, one of the areas that I want to make sure there's a couple of specialty areas that are highly significant, but really beyond the scope of what we're able to talk about today. Um, some of those things include um, housing for individuals who have to uh, register as uh, sex offenders in the community that have multiple restrictions on housing, um, housing for individuals where there's uh, immigration status or um, uh, asylum issues that may be involved, as well as finding sustainable housing for individuals who identify as LGBTQ or uh, gender non-conforming is certainly important issues, but really a little bit beyond what we're able to talk about today. However, when we talk about criminal justice system, um, I, one of the best places to start is with this map right here, the central intercept model. Um, I'm hoping some of you uh, have seen this before. Um, it's uh, a key part of anyone working with a criminal justice system, and I, I would imagine you might see that more than one time today because it's, it's that important. Uh, but really, it, it's, a, it's a really a great way of um, helping uh, individuals who are maybe not familiar with criminal justice to see the different places or intercepts uh, where a person might be with regards to their involvement with the criminal justice system. And it's really designed to help communities create responses to the needs of individuals with mental health and substance use issues that are involved with different intercepts within the criminal justice system. And so uh, communities all across the country participate in um, a SIM, sequential intercept model, mapping exercise that can help identify what services are available at the different intercept points for mental health and substance use needs and really help determine where they have gaps in their system to help you know, make informed decisions for the community about where they want to develop uh, different programs and services and where to invest their money based on the needs that this map would show. It also really creates a great uh, shared language and understanding for anyone who's working with a criminal justice-involved individual, 
whether it's in the community or within the court system. And I have been in multiple meetings with you know, judges and, and DAs and public defenders, and they understand this model. They, they talk about different intercepts, and it really allows everyone to be on the same page when we work with justice-involved individuals. The other part of that is, as you can see with that sequential intercept model, is that there is a need for uh, individuals from multiple agencies to come together really in, in an interaction and collaboration to address the different areas of need. Um, I, this is a, a list of sort of a, broken down to two basic areas. You can see one is more legal related um, agencies and individuals, the other is health and human services. And then at the bottom there really is a, a third group here which are both in both these areas and, and really neither, but you know, advocates and family and peer support are, are essential and part of the collaborative programming that occurs throughout the community to address the needs of individuals with mental health and substance use in the criminal justice system. You know, this also, with collaboration, is important that we both use that sequential intercept model and make sure we have a shared language. Uh, there certainly we. Um, tend to be siloed and uh, stay in our own area and work with individuals that are similar to us. But when we're talking about the, across the criminal justice system, and especially with reentry, we need to bridge the gap between different systems. And so making sure that people understand terms and not just use all the acronyms that we like to throw around that we know but others may not. Um, and also make sure we use each other as resources because um, there are uh, areas where we're the subject experts and can share information, others where um, it, we may rely on others. I'm not an attorney. Um, I've never played one on television. I, I wear a bow tie. I'm sometimes confused as an attorney. But having lawyers in the room to answer questions about legal terms and statutes is fantastic. And, and likewise, we can provide information for um, some of the justice professionals, like pr probation officers, uh, for example, need to know the ramifications of uh, uh, probation violation, if someone is placed in jail for a couple of days, they sometimes call that a quick dip. That may be a mild sanction in the criminal justice system, but someone who is in a temporary housing situation and misses uh, two or three days at their housing, they lose their bed, and so that mild punishment becomes uh, a major sanction in terms of they lose their housing or are now homeless. So making sure that we share information from both sides of that equation and within each other to get everyone on the same page. And, and one area where we have done that locally is, uh, you heard uh, Sherry mentioned the, the, the SOAR program. So if, if you're involved with homeless services or providing services for individuals with housing challenges, you may have heard of SOAR. It is, you know, stands for SSI, SSDI, Outreach, Access, and Recovery. And it's really just a model of how we conceptualize cases where an individual um, would meet the criteria for eligibility and put together a, a really great application to submit to have them uh, obtain SSI is, and SSDIs if they worked um, for a monthly check, as well as help them access other benefits. Really significant need for folks with mental health, substance use, and, and medical issues is, is getting insurance and Medicaid. That's especially important if you're a, a non-Medicaid expansion state. Um, getting food stamps or other uh, services and connections through the uh, qualification for SSI or SSDI is important, and really it's a, it's a program that's been around for about 15 years through SAMHSA. It is in every state, and there's a link there to um, the, the website. You can click on that, find your own state, find your state um, lead or uh, coordinator. Um, we have a fantastic program in North Carolina and um, a lot of support from the state system that allows multiple areas to be successful. Um, and has been really tremendous support for our program, which is a, um, a technical assistance grant through SAMHSA, which is a SOAR criminal justice initiative. So really focusing on bringing together those collaborators that you've seen in other areas to focus on uh, a program where they will share information, um, support the program, and uh, help address the needs of individuals with significant uh, mental health and substance use issues and, uh, and also medical issues to allow them to get the benefits to get stable housing as a way of uh, helping them exit the criminal justice system and find stability in the community. And so some, some of those areas include, you know, not just with jail, and, and, but criminal justice diversion in the community, uh, reentry services, we work with public defenders, and homeless services, which include behavioral health and, and medical providers, are all key 
players at different intercept points in that model and, and really use lever leveraging what your community resources are um, and any partnerships, individual agencies to uh, bring them to the table, including SSA, which is Social Security Administration, and DDS, uh, Disability Determination Services, are really not enemies. They're, they're partners in this. It's they, we work with our state office um, to make sure that they get the information they need to make good decisions about people's um, benefits and um, will partner or work with us when there are concerns. The other group that we're talking about, not just uh, in the community, but working with the criminal justice system directly, uh, especially with jails and prison, if we're looking at coordinating reentry and then providing services, starting with uh, relationships in the jail or in the prisons, with whether they have a coordinator or a release post, and certainly if they've had medical or, or mental health services there, those are important partners in an application for SOAR and helping someone get their benefits. Um, as well as having the opportunity to meet with someone while they are incarcerated. We found that um, if you can start that process pre-release, especially from um, prison, um, the, the goal is for a decision with regards to their benefits before discharge. Uh, so someone can essentially return to the community with their disability benefits and, and Medicaid and, and access the services they need. Um, it allows for much greater stability. Um, and helps them exit the criminal justice system and return to the community successfully. Uh, one other area I'll mention just in terms of access to records, uh, most of our folks that have been in prison have a plethora of records, and so accessing those in, in a meaningful way and using, utilizing that for individuals that have been in jail for a couple years because that's their medical record, and um, it, accessing that and using that information for their SWAR application is, is absolutely essential. Um, Using that sort of collaborative model in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, we, we've worked to train individuals at different points um, of this sequential intercept model in SOAR, although not everyone is doing SOAR applications. And so we have, we've made an investment in, in training to help us identify clients at different points in the intercept model so that, for example, the uh, jail inmates program to train staff, but they don't submit applications, but they may help identify someone who's currently in jail that may be a candidate and bring that to attention. The Public Defender's Office has two social workers that work with uh, defendants and their families, and they may either submit an application or refer them and, and help obtain collateral information for a application to disability. And we've also worked diligently with our local sheriff and Social Security Administration Office to get a local pre-release agreement. So. I mentioned uh, decision before discharge. Within the prison system, there's a 90-day agreement, but locally, all the agreements are between the county jails and the Social Security, and so uh, we did not have one. It took us about a year, which is a long time in most people's case, but when you have a lot of lawyers involved, it takes a little bit longer, so I would say persistence paid off, and, and it did come through. And, and well as working with our prison system, uh, one of my staff was fantastic in investigating information and found the central medical records fax number for the state prison system. It's not in the phone book, it's not online, um, but we can submit a request for information signed by the client to that number and get multiple state records, including um, psychological testing that may have been done in prison, but usually it just has a printout of scores versus a report, which is where myself and, and some of my staff come in that we can uh, take those numbers, interpret them in, into a summary to explain those for someone's disability application. And we've also worked with our judges and the prosecutors and uh, defense attorneys to allow us to have a judge sign a court order for a specialized psychological evaluation while someone's being held in, in jail to complete their application for Social Security and then submit a letter to the court that tells them that the evaluation was done rather than have to um, submit the report that may be uh, viewed as detrimental to their case by the defense attorney. So we just have to report to the court that it's been completed, um, knowing that this is for disability to get them out of the system and promote stability and housing in the community, um, which has been part of that early collaborative effort to get everyone on the same page and support this kind of a program. And, and so as a result, over the past two years, we've really had a lot of success with um, our applications that were at about an 89% success rate. And unfortunately, the cases that have not been successful were individuals that were re-arrested and then incarcerated 
for a longer period of time. Um, so their benefits, their, their application was denied um, based on administrative rules within the Social Security Administration. And we have housed 89% of the individuals um, who have been awarded benefits. So again, promoting stability in the community um, through this sort of a collaborative effort. Now what I'm going to do is turn this over to Justin, who is going to talk really a lot more about creating and sustaining uh, housing programs in the community, as well as some of the fantastic long-term success, success they've had with the, their SOAR program in Dade County. So, Justin? Hey, how are you? Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, so much. Um, I want to talk a little bit about my program here in Miami and then talk about um, our housing issues and, um, you know, what we do every day. And, and the program the Miami-Dade County Jail Diversion Programs gets people out of jail with uh, low-level felonies and all misdemeanors. Most of the cases are pre-adjudicary, which means they haven't been uh, convicted yet. We deal with some probation cases, but everybody in our program has been diagnosed with a serious mental health issue. We um, have people that screen them inside the county jail, and um, they are assessed for our program, and we're given what, what needs that they have would fit their, their qualification in the community, and we get them into programs or whatever they need to do to get better. Upon agreeing to work with the jail diversion program, they have to take medication, they have to stay clean, they have to stay in some kind of stable housing, and if they do all of that within the, the time, whatever the state attorney do, depends what case-by-case what -case basis, their charges will be dropped. So it's a good it's a good program. It's helped a lot of people. I've worked there the past 12 years, and I've seen a lot of changes. I'm going to share a little bit about my story, how I got here today, and a little bit of the work we do. It's it's rewarding work, but it is tiresome, and we do, as good as the program is, we do have a lot of struggles, uh, that of which is housing. And um, I w was on a couple of the uh, presentations yesterday, and it, it's amazing how big this struggle is across the country right now. So when we get people out of jail, we can send them to treatment programs, but one of our old options was assisted living facilities, uh, ALFs, as they're called in Florida, and they typically have raised their prices to $1,800 to $2,200 a month. That's for somebody that needs more stability, that needs to be given their medication, that won't take their medication on their own every day. But we all know a typical Social Security check, at least SSI in Florida, is only $750. Um, we found prices have gone up so much over the past decade because they found that serving people that are more elderly and had Medicare and they could get more subsidy for housing, they made more money. And you know, honestly, it's an easier population to deal with that somebody that's elderly than somebody that's maybe psychotic, using drugs or alcohol, you know, leaving the facility, and it's a, it's a easier business. It is a business at the end of the day, unfortunately. So we don't use these very often anymore. We just dropped Justin's audio, so I am going to reconnect him. And while we're waiting for him to join, I would love to hear what you're doing in your communities in terms of jail diversion and what are some of the challenges that you're facing. So could you please type in the chat box and tell us what that looks like for you? I see Lakeisha is noting how expensive the assisted living facilities are. Yeah, absolutely. What are some of the challenges you're seeing in your community? Lots of folks are typing, so I'm going to let you all type and read those responses while we get Justin back on the line. And if you have any questions for Justin or for Steven so far, please go ahead and type those into the all questions box, and we'll get to those as soon as we hit the Q&A period. Um, absolutely. Thanks, Kristen. You're welcome. So I am seeing... I am seeing lots of responses here. Um, this is complicated. 
So I think that all of your comments really do um, underline that. And lots of places are saying the ALFs are expensive. They also, um, you know, can be a much more restrictive setting than many people really need, especially after they've been stably housed for a little while. And this is moving so quickly that um, it's hard to actually read. And this is something, Stephen, that I think we'll be asking you when we get to the question and answer is... Yeah. Um, good, Sherry, I was listening. Oh, good. Yeah, no, I just think people are asking about if people have been incarcerated or in an institution for more than 90 days, they are no longer considered chronically homeless by HUD, right. and so it can be difficult to get them into housing. So um, right. and that's I'm giving you heads that, up. Yes, and I'll, I know Reggie will, I think, touch on some of these as well, but the, the, the federal government and some of the programs, they aren't uh, consistent. Um, so, so, for example, with, with SOAR, um, in terms of the, the housing um, criteria for being homeless and, or, uh, or at risk of homelessness, you know, being incarcerated puts someone in that category. But, but being in jail for 60, 90 days or in prison, then you're considered housed, which, um, right. you know, yes, it's housed, but it's not housing. So I, I, I know there's that difference, and, and that certainly is um, part of the, 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 the disconnect in the system. I noticed a couple of questions. I don't think I can address all those. Um, I, one had to do with access to uh, records for, for jail and, and certainly prison. And I, I completely agree that it is a, a very difficult, arduous task. Um, we, we try to get those for individuals' records out of state where, you know, we, we struggle and um, we end up uh, paying for them if we can, if, they, if they'll do that, right. and, and sometimes get. But that's you know that's the only way. If we need those, um, but within the state, we have, again we've been fortunate, and really it was, uh, I'll be honest, it was a lot of legwork to to make some connections with, you know, both with like mental health providers in the, in the prison system, and then through them get connected with medical records, and then medical records uh, get our state SOAR um, office involved. And so we have a, a, all, all that support connection so that we um, are all on the same page. And so you know, using their release can send that that is signed by the client um, to access get copies of their state prison records, um, especially if they've been in for a couple of years. Those are essential because that sure. really is their medical and mental health record. Um, they don't have one in the community. Right. Uh, thank I'm you. That, sure. Yeah, thank you. And we'll go into this some more at the end, but I believe uh, Justin is back with us. A co-moderator has joined okay. the conference. There we go. Stephen, thank you for that. And Justin, you. you are back on. Can you? Okay, I apologize. I don't know what happened. No I don't worries. know where I cut off, but it uh, hung up on me. <laughs> I guess the county forgot Darn to pay thanks. its phone bill this month, you know? It happens. Um, <laughs> But we're talking about ALFs, and um, they're just, you know, we don't use them as much anymore. We typically are putting people in independent housing facilities, which are any, on average 650 the decent ones, and that leaves people with some money left over from their checks. These are shared housing arrangements, maybe two or three to a room, um, people putting their food stamp cards to, to share food at the house, and sometimes they have a designated cook or... There's some that are better than others, though, and the better ones have clients that stay longer and are harder to get into, and the ones that don't have um, such a good reputation always have availabilities, but it's in not the best neighborhood for sobriety to try to get clean, or um, you know, we have issues with the um, housing managers because of the way they run things, and unfortunately, some people are not in this for the best of our clients and um, it is a business, but um, we send people to treatment programs, but after they get out of the treatment programs, where do they go? If they don't have Social Security, if they don't have family to live with, which many of our clients do not have, they have very strained family uh, problems, and you know um, they're in the criminal justice system, usually not their first time after they finish the treatment program, they'll stay in treatment longer. We see people staying in treatment longer and longer because they have no place to go. 
And what happens is we see that people um, they miss their they miss their mark. As they say, you know, you, you hit that high point in treatment, you're ready to move on to the next step, but you can't. You can't. Um, they find jobs, but let's be honest. I saw a slide yesterday that said only 22 counties in the United States can you rent a one-bedroom apartment at minimum wage. And here in Miami, making eight or ten dollars an hour, you're not going to get even a studio apartment for that. So, um, we work with homeless shelters, and they are very filled and hard to access. Some of these programs are only 45 to 90 days, and they have a lot of access to permanent housing through the homeless shelter. If you, you know, get the right case manager, the right social worker, and get in the right programs. And which is great that they can access long-term housing. Not This isn't an abundant thing now. But what I wish is that for people coming out of treatment programs, stable could access this housing as a, as a reward. And the system's a little backwards in the sense that we'll get somebody off the street, and they might not be stable in any kind of treatment, but we can get them to, in the housing faster than we can get somebody that's been stable in a rehab or, you know, for three to six months, and they'll have difficulty, and then that can cause them to relapse again without that stable housing. You know, it's a human right. And then when we do have people get maybe 30% or something like that, 30% rent, um, people to help with first or last, last month security deposit programs, um, we have issues getting them in because of, you know, their backgrounds. And it's just a struggle. It's just a struggle. And people want to live in better neighborhoods than they can afford. You know, um, you know, we talk about these ALF costs. That's, that's more than a mortgage. I mean, it's ridiculous, you know. But in Miami, things are expensive. And, you know, we want the best for our clients. But unfortunately, we're dealing with a broken system here. So the one thing I want to talk about, what Stephen was talking about, is uh, SOAR. Um, we have two entitlement specialists currently that work for our program that all they do full time is apply for disability for people. Um, we started this in 2007 in our program, in the jail diversion program, and that was the court specialist or the, the case manager. So on top of 100 some cases that a case manager would be managing with the court, they would have to apply for disability on top of them. And it was it was a very hard task to do, to manage all the records, to do interviews with people. But um, in 2011, we got a grant from the Florida Reinvestment Grant for three positions. And, um, you know, they sustained that grant. And now we have two full-time positions. And they only started keeping records in 2013. But since 2013, the records have showed that we've completed 631 applications. We have an approval rate of 90%, and average days to a decision is 43, which is amazing um, because we're picking the right cases, people that are deserving of disability. Through the process, through the screening tools we're using in the jail, we're getting to, to know the true history about somebody, and we're not just applying for everybody. You know, this isn't just a, everybody gets a check. It's if you're actually disabled, we have a way to write things to make it come out so that so the outcome is better. And just to show you, the national average is 65% approval rate, and the Florida approval rate is 66%. And I just want to tell you, uh, I'm a little short on time, but I want to tell you just personally, I'm an ex-client of Jail Diversion, and I... Uh, it was 12 and a half years ago. I was in an unstable part of my life, and uh, I went through the criminal justice system. I was forced into treatment, at least it felt like I was forced. And throughout that time, I was the first SOAR candidate for our program in 2007. Um, the now director, before we had any other positions doing it, applied for me. And, um, you know... I didn't want it. I didn't. I, I had always worked. I had always worked full time and held a job, and I, I felt it was uh, stigmatizing to receive some sort of, sort of government disability. But um, I got approved, and um, you know, it it was it was amazing because not only did I get approved, 
um, I got an apartment. And, you know, something about safe, a, a stable, safe place to live with a guaranteed rent payment, you know, as much as I didn't want it at first, you know, I, uh, I had my own place again, you know, out of jail, and it was it was amazing, you know. I had I had a place to rest my head and be safe, and to take my medication and cook my meals, you know. Um, it helped me stay on track with my appointments. I had a place to get mail. I had a place where I could, you know, come home from, you know, and be safe, and it, you know, it helped me gain meaningful employment. After I got disability, I got SSDI, which is based on work disability, not SSI, um, because I had worked so much before my, my crisis. And uh, I was able to work part-time, and I went working with the jail diversion program. And for six and a half years, I've been in jail diversion almost 12 years, for six and a half years I worked part-time while collecting disability. And um, it helped me, you know, live a fully life again. I, I gained stable relationships. I got my family back. I now have a, uh, a, a wife and, and son, you know. And um, luckily, you know, I kept on looking, kept on looking. Um, I was able to cancel my disability five years ago and um, work full time again. And this is, this is how these things work, and the system is meant to work. It's not meant to be a permanent thing to rely on these government resources, but it's to get people back on their feet again. And, you know, this program may have helped a lot of people, but it's truly helped me, and I'm able to give back to the community. So as much as the housing struggles are, um, you know, it's, if, you, um, if you play your cards right, you know, you can, and you stay out of trouble and stay in the right treatments, you know, you don't have to go back and be in a housing crisis again. Now, I know this is a, a good outcome, but it, there are good outcomes out there as much as um, as many crises as we are going through with housing. And, um, you know, I, um, I want to thank you guys for having me. Let me share. I want to pass it to Reggie so she can talk a little bit about um, housing. So thank you so much. And go ahead, Reggie. Thank you very much, Justin and Stephen and Kristen and Sherry. It's really a pleasure being here. Um, as, this, as already has been stated, across the country, housing is one of the top issues that is raised, especially for those living with serious mental illness and substance use disorders who are just as involved. As Stephen indicated, the sequential intercept model, or the SEM, is a very helpful tool to understand um, housing needs and options at different stages of the justice system. Because we know all too much that individuals with the history of incarceration are more likely to experience homelessness, and those who are homeless are more prone to arrest and incarceration, especially for misdemeanor or quality of life types of offenses. So I'm approaching this particular set of slides from the vantage of um, not a housing provider, but someone who is working in the justice system and the behavioral health, mental health, and substance use um, services. And uh, what I really would be trying to convey is how do you leverage and maximize services uh, and how do you really partner with housing resources? I look at housing in that kind of stages. If you think about this um, in uh, zero and one, it's really that crisis and emergency. Uh, two and three uh, is more kind of um, some of that housing, that permanent support of housing. I'm going to be expanding on a lot that Stephen has already talked about um, of his great work in Mecklenburg County. Um, and really using a housing framework. I'm trying to, oops, I'm trying to forward the slide here. There we go. So um, as a part of um, maximizing and leveraging housing, um, one of the first things I would say is get active. So a lot of times what I hear is, well, housing is such a problem, but nobody from the justice or behavioral health side is taking ownership of that particular issue. So um, I encourage everyone to move beyond what I would call scarcity thinking. In other words, thinking that, oh, it's a problem, but we can't do anything about it. But instead, of looking at what you do have, because you might be surprised about the resources that are currently available to you. I would suggest that you start with creating a housing inventory, looking at both those mainstream options as well as those non-mainstream options. So create a, a spreadsheet, um, work with different partners, and identify the different program names and the contacts, the populations that different housing types of options serve um, by age and gender, veteran status, American Indian um, 
status for tribal support? Um, is the housing providing single or family housing? Do they accept animals? Um, do they accept people with criminal history, sex offenders, as Stephen talked about? Do they serve domestic violence survivors? Do they work with those living with mental health and substance use disorders? What's the location? I always geocode all the housing to look for opportunities to co-locate resources and coordinate case management and care navigation services. What's the eligibility? For example, can someone on medication-assisted treatment or MAT protocols be in that housing? What types of housing is it again? Crisis, transitional, rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing. How is it funded? Talk more about al the alphabet soup later on, but there's all kinds of different funding resources. And then what is the housing and what's the capacity of the housing? Coordinated housing is a, something that's happening right now across the country. Um, one of the things uh, that's used often is a VI SPDAT, which is the Vulnerability Index Service Prioritization Decision Assistance Tool. Whew, what a name. Um, but basically, it's a way to help coordinate housing um, for the most vulnerable. It's really based on a medical need for housing. Um, I would be finding out who can complete that VI SPDAT. For example, can probation or co-responder or detox or mental health providers and substance use case managers be able to do that? Um, the eyes for that. Where does it go? Um, and making sure that people know once it's completed, they actually submit it and turn it in in order to be able to have their clients be prioritized. How is housing matched? A lot of times what we see is that you've got housing, things like permanent supportive housing, but the actual level of need of the persons in that housing may actually be able to benefit from a lower level, less, more subacute type of level of housing. But because, um, and especially without coordinated housing, you have individual programs that are prioritizing their housing. So uh, who might be highest on my list may not be the highest overall that needs services within a community. Um, I would ask about, is there a, bread, a bed registry to manage um, psych beds and emergency beds? That actually can be a great place to start by understanding um, what is actually known about housing and housing resources. Um, and then. I would always advocate that you get everybody on the housing list, um, regardless if there is coordinated housing, uh, because sometimes you just got to advocate for your folks. Um, the folks that I would be inventorying are, um, again, crisis services, looking at how long are folks actually staying in the emergency department or hospital. Um, what's going on in crisis stabilization centers? They sometimes can have folks. Um, by certain kinds of crisis up to seven days, sometimes um, 10, 15 days. Um, but I would also be inventorying where are the hotels and motel vouchers going and who accepts them and what are the primary hotels and motels that are being used. Um, where are the emergency shelters, um, what their criteria is and who do they serve. Um, I would look at things like managed camping um, types of opportunities or legal car camping um, in tiny homes across the country now eight different states have approved the use of tiny homes. Look at that um, kind of short-term type of, kind of day type of, of shelters. Get off the streets. Looking at transitioning and supportive behavioral health services as well as the housing all combined. These are great tools for people who are from jail, but also in lieu of jail. Uh, looking as, as Justin was talking about residential treatment centers, how do you use them to step down services and also as an alternative to jail. Um, and then looking also at halfway houses. A lot of times different states have the use of criminal justice involved halfway houses. And how do people step out of those particular houses? Look at group homes, uh, as Justin was talking about, that are with or without services, shared living arrangements, um, especially good for sex offenders, actually, congregate care types of centers, um, housing for persons with uh, developmental disabilities, scattered, house, um, scattered housing and site-based housing opportunities, those kind of nursing care, assisted living facilities, those requirements for folks to be there, recovery housing like Oxford housing, um, looking at uh, housing that's run by your housing authority, permanent supportive housing, and housing government is maybe paying for or programs are helping to offset that huge difference between what the 
federal government will pay for housing and what the actual housing rent go, is going for. Um, I would always look for landlord liaisons and who I can help uh, bring in to help partner with me in housing. And then also um, include who's currently on FUSE types of housing, which stands for Frequent User Enhancement um, Initiatives, usually three or more stays in forensic assertive community treatment, um, as well as respite care that are serving specific kinds of populations. So that's kind of the folks that I would be including in my housing inventory. Um, then I would meet um, specifically and directly with each one of those um, housing providers on a one-to-one -one basis. And also I would have cross um, meetings, convene meetings with justice system, behavioral health, and housing providers all together to talk about the um, both the gaps, but also really what the opportunities are to partner. I would want to understand what the housing rules are, how you can best partner, um, looking at, again, that of uh, thinking of housing as acute, subacute, and step down, and who's actually in those different levels of housing, and how to um, uh, cross-train staff in accessing housing, um, but also in housing providers accessing mental health and substance use services, and how to work with the justice system, as Stephen was doing a great job in talking about. I would be um, looking through uh, working with the continuum of care, so actually meeting with them, um, review the point in time that is done, and how does it reflect, if at all, justice-involved individuals and justice-involved individuals living with mental health and substance use disorders. Um, and I would make sure that um, people who are in jail, on probation, and detox are all counted in that point in time. That often is going to take a partnership with them. Um, I would seek to be on the continued care board um, or at least attend meetings. Um, and advocate for justice-involved populations. Uh, and then every uh, uh, community or every state is going to have an annual housing forum. And so I would want to attend that housing forum and actually ask to present at that housing forum. Uh, I would want to work with and review the local housing authority rules and uh, compare them to the HUD rules about access to housing. Um, read the local tenant protection laws and make sure that those laws are being created to support folks. By the way, pension of of funding um, to help support people so they don't lose their housing. Want to address what criminal history landlords can actually access. They can if they are allowed to access full criminal histories. Teach them actually how to read a criminal history so that they And I would work around ban the box types of opportunities um, to uh, both ban the box around employment and housing. The um, I would want to work around issues of, so who pays for housing? And look at how we can blend and braid funding and resources. Um, you don't have to be an expert in the alphabet soup um, between BASH and FUPS and ESGs and um, KBRAs and PSH. But what you do have to know is who is and help get to make sure that they're at the table. Um, in, Look at uh, Medicaid, even if, if folks um, do have Medicaid. Look at how transition services and sustaining health services are actually being used, because Medicaid won't pay for bricks and mortar, but they can help pay for some of those transition and sustaining health services. Um, meeting, meet with your local Department of Human Service and see, Services and see what they can offer around food stamps, stamps and TANF and rental assistance um, and how to access those services, build those linkages directly with them. Um, work with local foundations and grants to help pay for housing. Um, in Denver, we did a social impact bond, which has been a great way to re-engage foundations in getting funds for housing because there's a guaranteed return on investment and then advocate um, with state and, losing, state and local housing offices and authorities, including your local um, HUD office, to understand what um, they are, how they can best help you and support you in developing housing. 
and the consequences around the justice system. Uh, so working with um, simple things that aren't always so simple, um, that most housing providers and shelters require having an ID. Well, a lot of folks leave the jail and they don't have an ID. So can you work with the Sheriff's Department to actually create an ID at release that expires like in 30 days and then work with the providers, the housing providers to accept it. Um, work around, work with housing authorities, and shelters, and other places as preferences or carve-outs for housing. Um, we actually contracted with um, shelter beds and with transitional residential transition, transitional services for contracted beds. We paid regardless if they were occupied, um, but we always then had a guaranteed bed and we could manage who was in those beds. Um, work with and create landlord liaison and support intervention services. Um, absolutely work with peers and peer support um, and really focus on helping teach people daily living skills um, and of course um, help to do the education that's needed around things like you were talking earlier, that 90 day with HUD, but also around SSI. I'll talk a little bit more about that later when people are going to um, lose SSI because of being housed, uh, excuse me, being in jail um, 30 days or more, and then after a year actually having to reapply. The um, making sure that you're really diversifying housing options. Um, oftentimes I hear about things like group homes that just want to take people's money. Well, can you work with that group home to actually bridge and bring services to the group home for clients who are there and be able to coordinate resources in that particular regard. Um, can you work with hotels? If there's certain hotels that are accepting justice-involved folks, can you actually have space um, someplace in that hotel to have an office area for case managers to co-locate and be there to help support or peer services to be there and support folks? Um, can you, again, work with substance use service providers to be able to make sure that you are getting people to the right level of care first to stabilize before they're coming back into the community. Um, create kind of a universal set of questions to ask, uh, and I'll talk about more of that later on, um, but also creating a universal discharge policy and form and um, creating an information sharing sheet that has an opt-out instead of an opt-in um, part of it so that you can help move forward with folks being able to actually give permission to um, access services and to coordinate on their behalf. Um, think about being an air traffic controller, something David Covington talks about, where you know about where um, this person has been, what are you doing with them now, and where they're going, and always thinking in terms of the first day, week, month, and up to two years to help support folks. Thinking about the uh, issues of so intercept zero and one, thinking about opportunities to build those partnerships, um, meeting with shelters and understanding why somebody's not considered to be eligible for a certain kind of shelter. And that if you added resources, would that change? So for example, some places will medication assisted treatment. Can you educate folks that it really is a medical process? and how you can help make sure that people are using that medication safely and are not selling it on that campus. Um, can you, again, buy beds, uh, contract for beds uh, for, for folks and always have kind of an inventory of beds? Can you bring in integrated health services? So primary care, behavioral health, substance use. Um, can you work with your local federally qualified health centers and local universities and peer networks to help bring in resources and services? Um, can you help the shelters think about, so where is this person going from being in the shelter system? So have them think about what does this person actually need and then help to bridge those resources. Um, working around um, folks who are uh, not accepted, um, into shelters, uh, sometimes folks um, that are extremely high needs won't go into the shelter care system, especially if it's not low barrier, because their substance use um, disorder is so high that they're not able to not be intoxicated while they're actually in that particular shelter. So looking on low barrier types of shelters. Develop a familiar face list of high utilizers, those folks who are 
frequently coming through emergency rooms and justice systems and homeless services. Um, develop that list, look at the cost that actually is taking place with those services. We found it was over $28,672 per person per year um, and what services they actually need. Uh, elicit the support of other community-based providers to provide services. Um, for example, maybe somebody is in jeopardy of losing their housing because they're not regularly taking their medication. Maybe they're on a civil commitment like assisted outpatient treatment. Um, instead of the housing provider kicking them out, um, can you work with the housing provider to understand that we'll bring in mental health services, maybe it's a co-responder or a mobile crisis or care managers to help re-engage that client in taking their medication, um, thus saving that housing and increasing housing Excuse stability. me, Reggie. This mm -hmm. is the one minute warning you asked for. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, always working with peers, um, working around uh, providing wellness recovery action plans to help improve stability and understand crisis needs, and then also um, thinking through bridge housing and intercepts two and three, um, looking at services Universal kind of standardized questions again about at pretrial, at jail, probation court, public defenders, um, social workers, asking about housing, um, and then looking at a reentry checklist that has um, housing as a part of it, in addition to family supports and education and other resources that are needed upon reentry. Um, create a daily booking list. Have the sheriff's department create a daily booking list and send that to housing providers so that they know and treatment providers so that they know their client is in jail. Um, and then making sure that there are um, jail allows housing providers to actually come into the jail to get documents signed, and work with problem solving courts um, to make sure that folks are um, getting enrolled in treatment services. And last but not but not least is really looking at discharge types of services um, through kind of what I would call a hub and spoke model, looking at those most acute down to a step down process um, and meet with um, folks to really make sure that housing is going to be there when folks leave, making sure that folks are leaving for the jail with benefits, um, enrollment having already taken place, um, and making sure that the jail works with providers to have a notice of release or can a person be directly taken from the jail and released to that specific person? I will stop there um, and hand it back to Pam. Hi, everyone. Thank you. That was fabulous. There is so much information. I've learned a lot. So thank you for um, Thank you for all of your expertise, and um, I know that you also provided a thank you to SAMHSA, so here we go. Um, we're going to move into just a few questions and discussion points. Um, we've got a lot of questions and about nine minutes left. So let me, um, let me start with this. And I will direct it to one of you, and then please, if you know, please hand it off to your colleagues um, for additional information. So I find this um, the SOAR model with justice-involved folks fascinating. And Stephen, you started to talk a little bit about this before. If somebody's been in jail for 90 days, they've lost their, um, you know, their. Um, label as chronically homeless when they get out because they've been housed. Um, it, isn't, it isn't a home, but it has been stable housing, either in an institution or a jail. So do you have any tips on how we can um, manage that problem? Well, I think there are, there are a couple of things. One is with regards to um, applying for SSI or SSDI benefits um, through the SOAR process, if someone is incarcerated or um, were recently incarcerated, you know, they are eligible um, under the SOAR criteria to apply for benefits. Where, where it's the HUD definition of, of homeless that comes into play where then they don't qualify for uh, housing as, as chronic homeless. I think one of the other things with that is where you work with that that collaborative team. So helping, you know, the, the district attorney's office, the prosecutors understand that 
um, if you place someone in jail for X amount of time or um, you know, if the, the sentence, if, if they're in um, for more than a year in prison, they will lose their uh, SSI benefits versus if it's less than a year, they can have them turn back on rather than have to reapply when they come out. And so the same thing around you know, the homelessness, not, not that we want people to be homeless, but if, if we're housing them in jail, that is not housing, that is, that's incarceration. So right. if there's alternatives, looking at um, you know, alternative sentencing, um, you know, probation, um, even if it's uh, through a treatment program that maybe if you have, if you have uh, mental health courts or, or drug treatment courts, as, as alternatives to then going to our car incarceration because then you um, are putting someone in another category and they lose potential benefits of the government in certain areas. Thank you. Reggie, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that Stephen covered it all and that main point that he brought up of working with the criminal justice system to educate them about those rules around that 90 days, days and 12 months. Absolutely. And I love um, the idea of getting the SSI, SSDI benefits before release. I know we did a little bit of that when I was um, working on the SOAR program here in Montana and went and um, trained transition workers at the prisons um, on SSI and SSDI. It's a wonderful resource. Uh, Justin, this was a question for you. I've got a couple questions for you. So. Um, how long, one of the questions should be a pretty fast answer, but how long are your pre-trial trial clients required to stay drug and crime free before the charges are dropped? Hello, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. It depends on the case um, and it depends on the state attorney. With felony cases, they're usually at least 12 months and it's not a perfect 12 months, relapse is part of recovery, missing appointments is part of recovery. Uh, when we see repeated patterns and when the state attorney sees repeated patterns and um, more uh, maybe new charges, that's when things get complicated. But people are given multiple chances. Um, what we see less time, less than 12 months, is usually misdemeanor cases. They're usually maybe four to six to six. I mean, it depends per case, per charge, per victim, if there's a victim. Uh, domestic violence cases, we see, even though they're misdemeanor, uh, we see them take up to a year as well. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, this one, I'm going to have you start with this one, Reggie, because you've got a really great perspective on housing. I loved something that um, you said early in your presentation is you, we all need to move beyond scarcity thinking. And I think that a lot of the information you gave us really urges us in that direction. So that said, is there any advice on how to best house clients who have been in an institution, which could be jail or prison, or I think even a, you know, a mental health facility for more than 90 days? Um, are you thinking mainstream vouchers, flexible housing pools, master leasing? I know that in our um, local housing authority, we have a homeless preference for some of the Section 8 or housing choice vouchers, but oftentimes these clients can't access those. So thoughts on how to get people into housing? So again, I would look at the level of acuity of that particular person, not so much just the justice um, system involvement, but mental health and substance use. So if they are a person that um, has less ability for self-management, self-regulation, being consistent with medications, so they're more kind of at an acute or subacute level, then I would always look at permanent supported housing um, where there are support services that are directly available versus those who maybe are at a more step-down um, that could be a, a bridge housing first and then moving into kind of longer term, um, uh, either subsidized um, rents or kind of um, just other levels of, of housing as they get on their feet. So looking at the acuity level of the person is where I would start. Thank you so much. Um, here's another question for you, Justin. How did you get your state attorney's office on board with a diversion program and dropping charges? Um, this 
individual says they have problem solving courts, but there's no agreement to dismiss charges, which can create further barriers to housing, employment, and long-term stability. And I think um, we've only got about three minutes left, so if there's time after you answer, we'll get we'll get Reggie and Stephen to weigh in. Uh, three things real quick. Uh, a, we have Judge Stephen Leifman, who has uh, talked to in intensely over the years with the public defender and state attorney's office to help make this program work. And um, they know, our state attorney knows, it makes the community safer. Um, I, do, I do want to clarify that not every case is completely dismissed. If you have many prior convictions and certain prior convictions, it will be um, a withheld adjudication, which means it will still be on your record, but it won't be a conviction. So there is a difference. If you have uh, no process before um, or dismissals before or no previous conviction, it will be no process like it never happened. Wow, that is great. Any further insight on how to get this started in your area with the, you know, getting the state's attorney's office on board? Or I would, uh, I would promote recovery and um, and tell them to uh, to email me, and I'll try to hook you up with uh, my bosses, and uh, maybe they can, we can send you some resources in Miami to show, show what we've done. But to, just to, to go to their meetings and to to make time to contact them and. And, and learn the statistics of your community, your barriers, what, what really shows to be a difference. You know, talk to NAMI, your local NAMI chapter. Um, just bringing the community together and, and sh just getting a dialogue to the table is even a start. Thank you. Thank you all. We are so out of time. Um, I could keep this conversation going all day. I have learned a ton from all three of you today. So thank you for that. If all of you could take just a moment and type in the chat box one thing you'll take away from this session. I, I loved this session. I wish we had a little more time, but we are out. Um, I would remind you that SAMHSA's Homeless and Housing Re uh, Resource Network provides technical assistance and support. There are opportunities there. I encourage you to reach out if you need, um, if you need technical assistance or training. I would also say, please do give us your suggestions in the suggestion box and in the evaluations you fill out, because we will be mining those for ideas for TA and training next year and events like this one. Again, thank you to our fabulous speakers. I am so impressed with all of you, and the depth of knowledge is just breathtaking. So. Steven Strzecki, Justin Volpe, and Regina Hirder, thank you. And with that, I will encourage you to please attend the roundtable that's coming up next. It will be fabulous.